that all of us are um, on the same page and enjoying this experience. Uh, this event is um, being recorded. So um, if possible, everyone can be on mute. We're gonna open at some point space for interaction. So then you can unmute yourself and go ahead and um, exchange. I'm gonna be asking a few questions. So I would appreciate if I can have your interaction on the um, chat box because we couldn't, uh, for technical reason, could not be able to set up some polls. So if I can get your attention at some point and share, please, um, these, um, um, your answers in the chat box, that would be amazing. Take as many notes, as much notes as you want, because there's a lot of tips and tricks that I'm gonna be sharing the, uh, in this presentation. So they will be quite helpful for you. And uh, we will leave the Q&A towards the end, unless we open the space to do that. And without um, further ado, I'm going to be starting and just enjoy the, uh, the experience, basically. Um, I had almost 10 days to work on this um, project and um, to kind of revamp it and um, do a, give it a good feel. And I thought that I would spend a few hours per day um, actually preparing myself. So by the time I get to today, I will be able to feeling more comfortable with my time and there would be no pressure for me to uh, present. That was the target, but the reality is always different, right? I end up cramming all the work that I wanted to do related to this project and to this webinar in the last three days, and um, this is just to say that no one is immune from procrastination. Let's get into some facts and um, statistics about procrastination. In fact, before that, I want to ask you um, the first question here. If I can get you to answer in the chat box a number, how much do you feel that you choose your life? How much choice do you have in your life? From one being life is determined completely by external factors and you don't have much control. And 10, you have complete choice over any factor that impacts your life. So what would be the number that you would share if I can get you to leave a number in the, in the chat box, please? Well, how would you choose your life from one to 10? So I have between five, seven, eight. Any more people? We have 18 around in this um, talk today. So I'm seeing here people hovering between seven and eight on average. I'm going to say seven. So that's fantastic because you are much closer and um, most of you much closer to actually making choices in your life and feeling independent and free to make choices in life. This is really, really uh, powerful. So going into some of the stats and some of the facts about procrastination, ladies and gentlemen, did you know that based on a research that has incorporated a thousand people that for the last 42 years, procrastination have grown by six times, 600%. So it's a research that was done that has incorporated a thousand people back in 1978, and again, repeated in 2019, they have realized that procrastination has gone from 15% for that thousand people to 95%. I would say the five, they are in denial still. Now, what is a chronic procrastinator? A chronic procrastinator is a procrastinator that, um, that, actually, um, that actually suffer as a, as a procrastination as almost a pandemic or as a disease, basically. So if you want to drink water, change your clothes, simple things like that, you get to procrastinate on. Other piece of information is they say that one out of five people, they can jeopardize their career because of procrastination, their finances, their relationship, even their health. One more study that was done that showed that out of 40% of people get to experience financial loss because of procrastination. 40% of people who experience procrastination, they suffer with financial loss. One more study that was done that incorporated 2,700 respondents. And they, the question was, how much procrastination was impacting your level of happiness? 46% made 
they answered very much, whereas 18, they said extremely. So really, procrastination is a true pandemic. It's pandemic that is impacting your physical health as well as your mental health. So now to understand more the audience that we have with us today, can I please ask you to rate yourself from one to 10 in the chat box? How much do you feel that you are a procrastinator? From one to 10, how much do you rate yourself as being a procrastinator? So we have few procrastinators with us today. I have eight and six, nine, so we seem to be on the high end of the procrastination, hence your curiosity. Okay, awesome. So, so now that we know where you're standing with regards to procrastination, I'm gonna ask you to actually think about a, think about a topic, a goal, a desire, that you've been wanting to constantly achieve, but you've been procrastinating on. I want to invite you to think about this topic so you can refer to that topic throughout the whole presentation today. So if I'm going to be asking questions, if I'm going to be doing some small exercises with you, always refer to that topic and think about the big ticket item. You know, think about that career that you want to change or something that is not serving you that you want to let go of or that side hustle that you want to start, whatever that big ticket item that you, you have as a desire, but you've always been procrastinating on, you haven't, you've been stalling it all the time, right? So I want to take you through the anatomy of procrastination. Now, research have shown, ladies and gentlemen, that behind any task that incorporates procrastination, desire, goal, task, in fact, there is an inherent negative emotion. Because if there was no negative emotion involved behind that task, you would actually go ahead and do this action, perform the, the task that you need to do, and actually go ahead and get the reward. Your subconscious mind will give you the reward. Simple things in life, you can think about your, your daily routines, for, for example. Whereas if there is a negative emotion behind this task, if there is an inherent negative emotion behind it, your brain is going to detect a threat that, hang on a second, I don't want to be dealing with negative emotions. So you go ahead and procrastinate. And that's how the procrastination circuit happens. When you procrastinate and therefore avoid that negative emotion, automatically your subconscious mind will, will, will give you a positive relief that I didn't have to deal with that negative emotion behind that task. And if you do that on and on again, you will start getting a reward that I'm avoiding to dealing with that emotion. Once the circuit get built, once that circuit get built in your brain, eventually you build a habit. They say neurons that fire together, they wire together. And here we're talking about the anatomy of how the procrastination habit gets formed. So throughout the presentation today, I'm going to be sharing with you ways where you can reframe that circuit where you can interrupt and hack into your brain and reframe your circuit by introducing eventually an offsetting emotion against that negative emotion, so a positive emotion, and an offsetting negative emotion behind that positive emotion of procrastination. So stay tuned, and I will go through that as we're going forward. So I'm going to start with the model that I have created to overcome procrastination. The three pillars are to clarify or unpack, to reframe your mind, and to elevate and progress, obviously. So starting with the first step, which is clarifying or unpacking. What do I mean by unpacking? They say, I'm going to be sharing with you this slide, and this is coming from a previous webinar that I've done. By all means, you can use your phone camera to scan this barcode that will take you to that webinar, in fact, so you can watch it at your ease later. But all of us, all of you out there, you live in a comfortable place in your life. 
And then comes a desire. You know, the side hustle that we just mentioned earlier, or something that you want to let go of that doesn't serve you, but you have to, you have been always kind of um, pushing it away. And the reason you have been avoiding it is depends on how much risk there is incorporated with this desire, with achieving this task or desire, you might be confronted with fear. And when the stakes are high, when the level of risk is quite high, then you will be more, in most cases, defaulting back to your comfortable place. When you default back to your comfortable place, that creates the circuit that we were talking about earlier. But eventually, ladies and gentlemen, that will create anxiety. That will create some mental challenges that you would potentially come across if you keep on pushing away that desire from you. That desire, I always give the analogy of a flame. So imagine there is a flame inside of you which represents that desire, but it has been flickering all the time. Therefore, the burning sensation is not strong enough. But eventually with time, and I've seen this in many, many, many cases, eventually with time, ladies and gentlemen, that flame flickering will start stabilizing. So the, therefore the burning sensation will become stronger. And hence, if you don't cross the line of fear, you will start suffering from uh, mental challenges. And I can speak about that um, firsthand from my experience. So going back to that negative emotion that I mentioned earlier, a very important step right now is, I say always that a visible enemy is easier to fight than a hidden one. You want to understand what's underneath that negative emotion. And research has shown that in most cases, there is a fear. There is a fear behind that negative emotion. So if you have that, that desire that you want to achieve, ladies and gentlemen, and you want to understand, in case you go ahead and try to try to stop or do this desire or, or, or make the action towards that desire and you fail at that. What is the fear that you are avoiding? What's the fear that you are avoiding? And think, to, think, think for yourself, where else did that show up in your life? Where else did that show up in your life, ladies and gentlemen? Why is that important? Because you want to know what's behind that negative emotion, as I mentioned, and therefore, you need to know how to tackle it, how to, off, how to create a positive emotion that would offset that negative emotion so you would disrupt that circuit of procrastination. Super important step is to identify your saboteur throughout the process. All of you, all of us out there, we have that inner negative voice in our head that keep on telling us you're not good enough. What makes you think you're going to succeed where others have tried and they have failed? You're not worthy of success. What are you doing? You're taking too much risk. Stay in your safe zone. So think about a time in your life where you have experienced similar fear to that fear that you may experience should you fail attempting to, to actually achieve this desire. Where else did that fear show up in your life? And if that fear showed up in your life, what was that inner negative voice in your head telling you? And the key here, which I spend a lot of time with my client, is to identify it and personify it. And I'm going to explain to you why is that important, actually. So the next step in the model is to actually break the pattern. So as we said, everything is a brain wiring. All that circuit that we are talking about is based on brain wiring. So to interrupt the pattern, why is it important? Let me explain to you. A research that was conducted by Dr. Alan Watkins and neuroscientists have demonstrated that emotion is energy in motion. Emotion lives in your limbic system as part of your subconscious and it's energy in motion. Now the awareness of this emotion makes it a feeling. This is when you are changing from your limbic system, from your subconscious to your conscious mind. So why is that important to know? So as we said, based on the, um, the hypothesis that we have here, if emotion is energy in motion and the awareness of this emotion makes it a feeling, now what is if you're not aware of that emotion? If you're not aware of that emotion, 
So then that your experience of that emotion becomes a subjective experience. What does that mean? If you are feeling weak, helpless, um, you know, um, some negative emotion, any kind of negative emotion that you would you potentially experience, fear, that becomes part of your definition because you feel that this is part of who you are. If you're feeling like a victim, if, you, if the emotion is a victimship, that would be part of your definition. So, so you wake up, you go to sleep, you go to work, you do whatever you do, that is who you are. It means that this emotion got you, is in control of you. So why is that, you know, wh what does that mean? It means that you get to put most of the, um, most of the obviously reasons behind the way you're feeling to external factors. And eventually, that's how you end up feeling like a victim. That's how you end up feeling like a victim. Now, if we go back to talk about emotion and feeling, did you know that based on that research, they have discovered that all of you out there, all of us get to experience on average per day, 12 emotion. We get to experience on, on average per day, 12 emotions. Whereas they have discovered a myriad of emotion that you get to pick and choose from and always refer to, should you choose, if you are aware of that. Now, my question to you here, if you can put a number in the chat box, how many emotions do you think this study have discovered? In the, in the spectrum of emotion, any emotion that you could think about in the world, how many emotions do you think they have discovered in that, um, in that study? Can anyone guess, please? What would be the number that you would put in there? How many emotions do you think that study have actually discovered? Anyone would put a number out there? I have 20. Chantel, thank you. 14, Max. Any other guess? Just a wild guess, 35. Right, fair enough. Actually, we're not too close. There is actually out there 34,000 emotion. There are 34,000 emotion out there that you, you get to pick and choose. Now, if we go back to that theory and we are aware of that emotion, that means that you are experiencing now a feeling. This means that you are experiencing a objective experience. When you are having an objective experience, ladies and gentlemen, it means that you are moving that emotion from your subconscious to your, to your conscious mind, therefore you are extracting it, you are extracting it from your mind and you are able to actually objectify it. You are making it, uh, you are making it outside of your system and then you can challenge it. Is this really true? Is this really true? This is when you can make a choice to think to yourself, am I really weak based on my life history, based on everything that I've done? Am I really vulnerable? Is fear an emotion or a feeling that makes sense to me right now? When you objectify this emotion, it becomes a feeling, it's extremely important for you to extract it and to actually examine it and challenge it. And that's how you make the choice. And when you make the choice, you can break the pattern. A Couple of tools that I can share with you to actually break the pattern. The first one is um, invented by by Mel Robbins, and there was a research that was done behind it. It's very simple. It's the five second rule. And all what it is, you count backward from one to five. And you, by counting backward, because you, you're not going on auto mode, you have to stop for a split of a second and think, then you are actually count, you know, you're moving from your, your, you're moving from your auto system to your consciousness or to your conscious mind. And when you do that, then you can ask yourself the question, how am I feeling? How am I feeling? Why am I feeling so negative? Where is that coming from? And another tool that would complement this one is the um, journaling technique, which I spoke about in another webinar. Should you like to learn more about it, by all means, take your camera on your phone and scan this, scan this barcode. It will take you there. You can watch it at your ease later. Why is it important to journal? The, two, the way I would um, invite the clients to actually journal the, the ones that I work with, especially if you don't have experience in journaling, is two ways. Either 
you could, if you're doing it on a computer, you could time yourself, put an alarm for 10 minutes and keep writing nonstop until you get to 10 minutes. The other way is to actually, um, if you have a notepad or I mean, you know, a notebook, you can start writing until you finish three pages worth of writing. So what happened in that experience? You get to declutter your mind. You get to extract all the noise that is happening in your mind and that causes clarity and focus for you. And eventually something will come out of your mind and you will realize that, hang on a second, I'm feeling like that. Is this true? What's my choices? What do I choose to feel? What's the emotion that I want to experience here? So before I go ahead and continue with my explaining my model, I want to share with you um, the, um, the, some of the testimonials of people who have actually experienced this model of overcoming procrastination and getting to reinvent themselves. So what, what did the method work for them? And what was the most powerful part? And what was the impact on their life? So I'm gonna start the video. If, can, if you can give me a thumbs up, if you can hear um, the audio. Hi, my name is Phil Myler. I'm an actor, producer, and voice artist. Everyone can hear? Perfect. And I am a procrastinator. Sounds like an AA meeting? Well, that's because all of you guys have been there too, right? All of you here have the same problem I have, maybe not as much as I am. But yeah, you know, if you don't control procrastination, it takes over your life and it makes a big mess of everything. And that's what was happening in my life. And then I met Lohan and I was in a session with him. He gave me all those tools, you know, all that notion about eating the elephant one bite at a time, about naming your little devil of procrastination that's making your life into a mess. You know, that whole thing of uh, motion that generates energy, which generates momentum and generates traction all that works you know if you apply it you can make it work and I'm still struggling I know you know it's like eating the elephant one bite at a time but believe me it works and it has worked for me and I thank Loha for that very much all right Hi, my name is Lucia Kim and I teach English and Portuguese for foreigners. Uh, I love what I do, so I consider myself lucky because of that and also because I was able to attend Lohan's lectures and have a session with him. Right after one of those lectures, a webinar, I realized something had happened because I was able to interact with people, which is something that would have never happened before because I wouldn't feel comfortable doing it. And, uh, well, a proof that his method is effective is that I'm here making this video. And this is something that would have never happened before, Lohan, because I'm a camera shy. Uh, I learned that when we identify the source of our fears and when we are aware of the voices that try to make us stop and give up our dreams, it's much easier to fight against them and to handle the situation in a much easier and comfortable way. So I thank Loha a lot for uh, this opportunity and for all his help that definitely helped me a lot. Thank you, Lohan. Bye. You may be wondering why am I talking about procrastination and fear? I want to share with you very quickly my experience with dealing with procrastination and fear. So I was born in a war-ridden country where I had fear running through my veins at a younger age. Eventually, I had this desire to become an international person. So I ventured out, and this is when I moved at a younger age to Australia. I fell in love with the country, and I wanted to make Australia my new home, but that was not feasible at that time. So I had to actually 
deal with um, risk, deal with uh, getting resourceful. And I stepped out of my comfort zone to study something that was not in line with my career objective. And I started to become a cook. And eventually I managed to stay in the country. And that's how I made uh, Israel my new home. Now, moving forward, I end up um, working for Toyota. And I started my career there as um, a, a finance professional. Um, it was a very secure job and it gave me everything that I wanted in terms of um, security and um, you know, all the benefits that you could imagine. But that bug of um, being an international person kept on haunting me. And it wasn't possible for me to step out of the um, country with them, so I had to do it on my own. Because there was too much competitive interest for me to lose and there was too much risk there, I ended up staying in that position. And that caused me a lot of, obviously, anxiety and internal conflict until I got to a stage where the pain was so much so that I had to, uh, you know, so high that I had to step out and take that leap of faith. And this is when I started my first position with Louis Vuitton um, in Dubai um, as, um, in, 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 the, in the finance department, obviously. Um, and they say, careful what you wish for. Boy, did I end up becoming an international person. So I end up living in five countries in total. I worked with them for 10 years in three countries. My last assignment was in Brazil um, as the CFO of um, South America, basically. Uh, eventually, my values in life have changed. And you could imagine the procrastination and all the hesitance that I have come across for me to shift my career from where I was to where I am right now. So I had to deal with also a lot of conflict and it took years for me to realize that I have to follow my values. I have to follow my desire. And my desire is to start influencing people at a, at a larger scale than my direct team or the company that I work with. And also I wanted to become an entrepreneur. And that's how I ventured out to be a speaker, mentor, and um, coach basically. So that's my story with the procrastination. And now I'm gonna be talking to you about the the, the other step, the third step, which is the cost of inaction. The cost of inaction. What do I mean by cost of inaction? First, I want to ask you a quick question here. How do you rate yourself? How do you rate yourself on anxiety, on your anxiety level from one to 10, where 10 is the highest and one, you don't deal with any anxiety? How would you rate yourself on the anxiety level. So I have three, eight, six, yep. So it's on average, it's fairly, it's, it's, it's higher than seven on average. So research have shown, ladies and gentlemen, that even if you have low level of anxiety, people who suffer from low level of anxiety, they get to have 30% higher chance of mortality, 30% higher chance of mortality. Now, what do I mean, going back to the cost of inaction, what do I mean by cost of inaction here? Think about that desire that we were talking about earlier and imagine, imagine, this is a very important step, that you would actually not do anything and continue doing your life the way you are doing it right now and you would never go ahead and make an attempt to achieve that, that goal or that desire that you want to achieve. What would happen to you in your life six months from now, one year from now, and three years from now? What will be the impact on your emotion? What will be the physical impact on you? What will be the financial impact on you? Think about it for a second, especially if you want to let go of something that doesn't serve you in your life. What would be the emotional impact there on you? This is an extremely important point, um, part. Why? Because when you answer this question, going back to that circuit that we were talking about, the piece that is related to having procrastination, I mean, starting with the procrastination because you're avoiding the negative emotion. Now, when you realize that you're going to be, there was a, there was a cost for, for not having any action, you are offsetting you are hacking your brain by offsetting that positive emotion by, of, of procrastination. So you had your desire, then negative emotion, 
then you were procrastinating. Now you're gonna introduce a negative emotion if you actually procrastinate. And this is what is this all about. That's why I kind of dig deeper a lot with the people that I work with, with regards to what would happen to you if you continue doing what you're doing and not actually um, go ahead and achieve that or attempt to achieve that um, goal. Now, I wanna talk about the notion of a negative belief system, which is our biggest blockage that gets us to move forward and take risks in our life. And that is the source of your sabotaging mind, of your inner negative voice, that monkey brain, that monkey chatterbox, so to speak, right? So where does that come from? Any belief system that you have today is based on past experience. And a belief system um, shows that a past experience equals the present. So it gets you to create a story in your head. So that story will only be a story unless you live that story in your mind every single day. So that eventually will become your emotional home. So imagine that you are driving on your life journey and you're always looking at the rear view mirror. What's gonna happen to you? Eventually you're gonna be crashing. I can speak about the my one of one of my negative belief system to share with you a quick story one of my negative belief system that i am an imposter that i am fake and there was an incident that happened with me at work in fact which i will share it with you quickly when i was working at toyota based here in sydney on on day two of every month we used to have a um, meeting called it the flash meeting which explains all the all the, all the financial information that happened for the month. Now, I showed up to that meeting today. There was 120 people on a conference call between Sydney, Melbourne, and Nagoya in Japan, which is the head office of Toyota. And there was a variance on the stock that I couldn't explain. And I decided to wing it and show up and give some vague explanation. Little did, did I know that when I actually started explaining and my turn, my turn came to start explaining the variance, the more vague I was, the more I'm getting challenged by everyone in that meeting, even individuals who never actually get involved in, in that sort of meeting, they decided to challenge me that day. Did that ever happen to you before? And you, kn you knew you didn't know what you were talking about clearly, but you didn't admit it. You just kept on winging it, so to speak. When my, my, when my turn ended, and the other city started presenting, I leaned back on my chair, obviously furious and frustrated. And the first reaction was a very vocal and um, disrespecting reaction towards the people that decided to, 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 to challenge me and they have never contributed or never got involved in that meeting before until I realized that the microphone was still on. So at that point, all what I could do is stand up and go for a walk. Now, did you ever experience that imposter syndrome where you feel that you don't know what you're doing and someone's going to discover that? And even if it's something that is completely explainable, that as in it can be rationalized why you don't know what you're doing, but you take it upon yourself that you are an imposter, you're a fraud. That feeling kept going with me throughout my career. Ironically, I ended up becoming a CFO and I'm still not completely confident about some of the accounting technical matters, but that wasn't the point. The point is that I'm a leader leading a company for a specific region and I need to know how to operate the people who knows what they're doing, so to speak but I couldn't think about it that way. I was always blaming myself that I don't know my, enough. Someone's gonna discover that. And the level of anxiety that I had, have had experienced throughout most of my career was quite significant until I eventually I learned how to live with that emotion, with that belief system. So shifting gears, the next steps that I'm gonna talk about them together is obviously, the elevate step, which is the value add, 
the process or the planning and the action, which all leads to progress, obviously. So starting with the, with the value add, what do I mean by value add? Another very important step, if we go back to the initial chart, this step will be offsetting the initial negative emotion that you have experienced behind that desire. So when you are experiencing that negative emotion that, that behind that desire, now we are introducing a, a positive experience that what if you would actually even make an attempt to achieve that goal and it would actually go ahead and work and you would succeed at it. What would be the benefits? What would be the results? And rate them from one to 10 for you to see the significance on you. Rate them from one to 10 for you to see the significance on you and on your life. Very, very important step. And the next thing is for you to break down that big task that you are dealing with. You know, as, as Phil in the video said, I always say that you don't want to be eating a, God forbid, an elephant in one bite. You want to eat the elephant one bite, one small bite at a time. So what happens when you are dealing with an um, intimidating goal or task that you want to achieve, your brain forms that cloud and you only see that big, big ticket item that you're going to be dealing with and you keep on avoiding it, avoiding it. But when you break it down into small achievable tasks, then eventually you'll be able to see it from a different perspective and start targeting the low hanging fruits. A super important step is to assign these low hanging fruits or anything that you choose to start with against a calendar item basically. So you would have it locked in. Super important point here. Then with the action, the, um, the mental state that you need to have when it comes to achieving the action is to connect with the better version of you. So I wanna invite you for a few seconds to close your eyes and think about a time in your life where you were so proud of yourself. Think about a time in your life that you're so proud of yourself that when you think about that moment, specific moment, you got that promotion, you get the pay rise, you got married, you proposed to someone, you, you, left, you let go of something that doesn't serve you. Whatever that moment that you felt so proud of yourself, that when you think about it, it gives you the goosebumps. And imagine that you are, you are watching yourself as if you are watching a movie trailer. And imagine what is going on in your head. What's that voice in your head, the positive voice, the sage voice that I call it, is telling you? Because you have the negative entity and you also have the positive entity. And that's the better version of you that you cannot connect with. And when you connect with that, ladies and gentlemen, you can open your eyes if you haven't done so. You will be able to get into that passionate state. And when that happens, you'll be able to create momentum. Now, why is it important to create momentum? I always say that basic physics, movement equal energy, equal momentum, equal traction. So whenever you start moving, energy is gonna be created and that's how you create momentum and traction and eventually progress. You wanna start with the first step. There was a lot of research that, that, that speaks about how to form, how to let go of a negative habit or how to form a positive habit. And they all say the same thing. You gotta start with the first step. That is why when I was talking about the process or the plan, start with the low hanging fruit. It's the email that you're gonna send. It's that, that, that documentary that you're gonna watch, whatever it's gonna take you for you to start with that step. If you wanna declutter your closet, just open the closet and just take a look at it. That first step you gotta start with. And that brings me to that theory of the two millimeters. Now, why do I, what do I mean by the theory of two millimeters? Let me quickly share my screen here with the whiteboard so I can explain to you enough. Now you, excuse my drawing abilities, you live here, right? And this is your comfort zone. This is where your comfort zone is, ladies and gentlemen. And at some point in your life, 
you have a desire that is sitting in here. But to go from here to here, to achieve that desire, this is going to stretch you. In fact, it's not even sustainable. So based on the cognitive behavioral therapy model, which, which works with predominantly with people who have phobias, if you have a phobia against you know, stepping outside of your home, the first thing that you would do, you, you go and stand in front of the door, but from, from, in, from the inside. The next step is to open the door. And the next step is to stand at the door and then so on and so forth. So what you need to do is you need to make the two millimeter steps, two millimeter steps, two millimeter steps, every single day, have that conversation that you, you are avoiding to have every single day, go to that workout that you've been avoiding to do, and eventually you will build a new comfort zone. So that will no longer be your comfort zone. This will be your comfort zone. And do, you continue doing the same thing. Two millimeters at a time, ladies and gentlemen. Two millimeters at a time. Maybe that's more than two millimeters, but you got my point. Two millimeters at that time, and eventually you will create another comfort zone. And this desire, this desire become part of your comfort zone. And that is the essence of the work that I do. You don't want to be stretching yourself. You're going to go two millimeters at a time. Now, going back to, excuse me, the presentation here. We have the model, but we have, we need pillars that actually sustain the model. So we need a kind of a proper blueprint that you would have that would enable you to grow and reinvent yourself. And these pillars is the discipline and community. Now, why is it important? Discipline help you to become more assertive. It would enable you to have more clarity in your mind and you get to become more focused on your targets, therefore. And it enables you also to become more emotionally stable. And a super important um, notion, which is the raising your standards. What do I mean by raising your standards? Raising your standards means that you are moving your should into the must. So if you say to yourself, and here we are talking about neuro-linguistic programming. If you say to yourself, I should go to the gym, I should go to the gym is one thing. And if you say, this is my new standard, I must go to the gym. This is my new definition. This is who I am. I must go to the gym. And it's not even negotiable. As long as something that you desire, that will become your new standard. And discipline help you to do that. One way I use to grow my, my, my discipline is the 30-day challenge. They say, research has shown that 21 days take you to form a new habit. I get to stretch it to 30 days. And if you go on Google and Google 30-day challenge, there are, you will find thousands of, of articles or even ideas of what can you take on a 30-day challenge. And the reason I put it on a piece of paper so I can make it visual in front of me. So I'm creating a chain every day. I'm taking a, a, a habit, basically. So I don't want to be breaking that chain after the 30 days. And you'll be surprised how many habits you get to take on in your life. I do that every other month so I can give myself a break. Now, community, why is it important to surround yourself with the right community? Based on, neuro, uh, on um, mirror neurons, science, they say that you are the average of the five closest people that you have in your life. You are the average of the five closest people that you have in your life. So you get to copy their, the way they think, their traits, their habits, their character. That's how you actually also get to transform eventually. So... The question that I asked you before, and knowing what you know right now, ladies and gentlemen, where do, where do you rate yourself on the choice? Knowing that everything is happening in your brain and they're all circuits that you could rewire and do everything about it that you want. Where would you rate yourself on the level of choice, ladies and gentlemen? Where one is everything is controlled by external factors and 10, you have control over all the choices that you make in your life. 
where would you rate yourself? What, what number would you give? If you can leave it in the chat box, I would appreciate it. So I have a 10. Fantastic. Eight. So we were hovering around seven, and now we are talking about eight and 10 so far. Appreciate your contribution. So now the call, the action that I would suggest to you, knowing what you know right now, is think about five fearful steps, five, five fearful steps or actions that you want to take, although it will be challenging you, but you know that it's going to benefit you. And you want to assign a accountability partner or someone that you know where you could share with that person, when can you do that? This is all from a spirit of starting the momentum, starting the action, starting the momentum and starting the action, ladies and gentlemen, eventually for you to get to the progress. And um, last but not least, I've come across this, um, this sign on the street somewhere in one of the countries. And I thought it was quite interesting for this um, talk because it says a lot. And I'm gonna be leaving you with that. Now, beyond that, I would like to invite you to connect with me. Um, if you wanna scan these barcodes using your phone camera to connect with me, or you can look me up using this um, username on all the social media. I get to put a lot of content and a lot of events that I get involved in, and I would love to connect with you to share with you a lot of my contacts. Um, I normally give an offer at the end of each, my, each of my webinars, and the offer that I'm giving for the audience of Laneway here is to continue doing that work and deepen the work. So if you want to really tap into the strategies and the solution and apply it on yourself, and I have seen miracles. In fact, one of the two testimonials is, came from one workshop. So I'm inviting you to a workshop that I'm running um, only for five people. So it can be, they can incorporate a lot of intervention as well as coaching during the workshop. It's an hour and a half, and then you will get a coaching session for um, 45 minutes after that. So if you are interested, all what you have to do, again, is use your phone camera and scan this um, barcode with your phone camera, and that will um, take you to your email, and you just send me an email where, you know, with your interest. And other than that, um, I would like to um, thank you for your patience. And I hope that um, you know, I've delivered beyond your expectation. That's the intention at least. I would like to ask you for anyone who um, is uh, still there to leave one comment, one comment in the chat box just to explain your experience today. If you can leave one comment that, explain, that describes your experience from this webinar today, I would appreciate that. What would be the comment that you would leave in the chat box that would describe your experience today? I know it's lunchtime and everyone is rushing to go to work. Now, now I'm gonna be opening this for, um, for any questions. If anyone have any questions, anyone yes, would like? Yes. Sure. Thank you, Laura, thank you, Laura for your talk. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, um, at the beginning, you show us a graph with uh, the increase of procrastination. Uh -huh. Yeah, and it's very significant. You know what the reason for, for this big increase like that? What, what's the reason behind why people are so... The 95%, the going to 95%. Yeah. Um, well, you know, based on the research, I mean, there are many, multiple factors. But uh, one, of the most, uh, one of the main contributing factors is um, the fast pace of life. So from 1978, when you have all the technology, the internet, the phone, the notification that you have on your phone, the, the impact of the notification on your brain every time you are getting triggered, that is actually causing your level of focus to deteriorate significantly, okay. significantly. I hope that this answers So, so the question. increase of technology has... Technology yeah. predominantly and the fast pace of life because everything kind of follows together, right? Like the commute, yeah. the, um, you know, everything that kind of, um, uh, as a result of that dominant effect of, of moving the world from 
um, you know, from, from not having internet or mobiles or notification, all that sort of stuff, to, to where we are today. Yeah, yeah? <laughs> let, alone the, let alone the pandemic, <laughs> which is gonna be, which is gonna be another level right now. We're taking, the, we, we, we're upping the game right now, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So any, anyone else have any other questions? You can unmute yourself by all means and ask any question, any interaction that you have. Anyone else? This is your chance if you, if you are interested or you are curious. I'll give it a few more seconds. I don't have a question, but I would like to say thank you very much. That was like amazing, very easy to understand, very inspiring. Uh, I really enjoy it. Thank you very much for participating. <laughs> my pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. And thank you once more, you and Thais, as well as the Laneway um, to host me here today. And it's, um, it's been um, a pleasure. Just to, this is my first event, actually, I'm doing it in Australia, even though I've been living here since the beginning of the year, because most of my events are international uh, and I connect on Zoom courtesy of the corona um, oh. so um, so yeah I'm, I'm quite I'm quite pleased um, to have uh, to have uh, my first Aussie experience <laughs> oh that's amazing we are very pleased as well so we are yeah. the lucky one to have you on board my pleasure it's, it's my pleasure so if no one have any question by all means connect with me I would love to you said you have a question Walter no I don't have any question I just want to say thank you <laughs> okay yeah no worries um, so, um, yeah, I mean, I would love to connect with you. I would love to continue the conversation. Um, hopefully, perhaps in the future, we might have opportunity to do other events with Laneway. But uh, regardless, um, let's connect together. If anyone is interested to deepen the work, to really go, go into the solution and the strategy, and to actually experience a shift in procrastination, by all means, send me an email, and I can talk to you further about this experience and this um, workshop that I'm organizing. Otherwise. Um, Thank you everyone once more and um, we will keep in touch, hopefully. Great. Thank you very much everyone for joining Loham in this amazing afternoon with a lot of information. Uh, so, and that's it. Next week we have a takeaway lunch. If anyone wants to join, uh, we always post you on our social media. Next week we're gonna have one student talking about creating content in from social media. If anyone is interested, just feel free. To register. Thank you very much again, Laura. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a great afternoon and the remaining of the week. Um, great work week. Okay. You Take too. care. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone.